Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our University of Maryland Alumni Homebuyer Workshop. My name is Jason Maida. I'm with American Pacific Mortgage. Really excited to be with you this evening. Um, tonight's class has a runtime of about an hour, so we should be wrapped up by the top of the hour. Uh, and this is a very interactive session. So as we go through tonight's content, really encourage you to ask questions. Um, we're getting started right at the top of the hour, but I know we'll have probably other guests that'll be joining us through uh, tonight's class. And if you have questions as we go through through tonight's class, we'd encourage you to use the uh, Q&A or chat function within Zoom. And what we'll do is we'll answer questions on air for you uh, just to be able to kind of make sure we're providing clarity, uh, clarification on certain topics that we go through. But we do really try to make these um, sessions very interactive. And uh, we're, we're grateful that you decided to, to basically join us on a Thursday night. We know you have other choices of what you can be doing tonight. So we appreciate that you get a chance to get connected with us. A little bit about our organization. So we are, have been in partnership with the University of Maryland alumni for just over about a year. Um, we teach four of these classes per year. Um, and um, they're basically centered around home buying and really providing you tools and resources to, that can help you on the path towards home ownership. So we're a nationwide lender. Uh, our team is based out of California, but we work in all time zones. And most of our work with clients is done over video, just like this. So you're gonna hear me talk tonight a little bit about consultations with clients. So that's one of the things we do over video. Um, so really it's not um, some a situation where we're um, um, you know, in person in a branch per se, but most of the stuff is done on on video or phone. Um, I you know, specialize in first time home buying and educational resources for you. So, you know, a lot of what we'll talk about tonight will be all centered around first time home buying. And speaking of our topics for tonight, this is kind of our talking points. Uh, we're going to spend some time looking at the housing market a bit. We'll talk somewhat about interest rates, how that can influence your buying. We'll also spend some time looking at a rent versus buying calculator, where we can kind of better understand the comparison of continuing to rent versus what it could look like as ownership. We'll also look at credit and how we can kind of optimize credit for our home buying scenario. We'll spend some time looking at student loans, different programs that are available to you as a first time buyer, some of the documentation that we'll generally ask you to get together if you decide you want to put together a home buying plan for yourself. We'll also talk about first time buyer programs, as well as the process of buying a home. So after tonight's class, if you say, you know what, I kind of want to look at some of my options, I want to put a plan together for myself, we'll kind of share with you how to get connected and start on that path towards home ownership. All right. Again, this is going to be a very interactive session. So we encourage ask ask us questions as we roll through tonight's content. We love to make sure that you get the right answers for yourself. But we'll also carve out some time later on in tonight's class to uh, go through any uh, questions that might not get answered. All right. Well, let's think about home buying a little bit, because for those of us in tonight's class, it's probably going to be one of the biggest investments you decide to make in your financial futures. Um, and so taking time out on a busy Thursday night, you know, is 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 obviously a huge um, time commitment. Right. And so obviously for those of you who are in tonight's class, you're kind of serious about thinking out what about what a plan might look like for you. And I would encourage you to kind of take a little closer look at what the benefits are to home ownership. So I think that gets a little bit lost at times. You know, when you think about the benefits of owning a home, you have the opportunity to obviously be owners, but you create the afford or stability, I guess, in your affordability. And what I mean by that is, you know, going in, being able to have a set monthly payment for your housing expense, not worrying about maybe your rent increasing on an annualized basis. This home potentially could grow in value over time. The difference between the value of the home versus what your mortgage balance is, that difference is called home equity. And that equity can turn into wealth over time. In fact, it can create generational wealth potentially for your family. And there are some tax benefits that can still come along with owning a home. Um, so those are things that we want to kind of factor into the equation when we're thinking about home ownership. I always tell clients, you know, it's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison. So if I'm paying $2,000 a month in rent, that's not going to look the same at $2,000 in mortgage payment. And to help us kind of a better understand that, we always kind of like to launch into a calculator to help us better kind of frame up for us what home buying could look like for us. And this is our Freddie Mac rent versus buying calculator. And I'm going to do a quick little screen share of this calculator and walk you through an example to start tonight's class. Now, before I forget all the information that I share with you this evening, we're gonna send out um, the presentation material. So you're gonna have all the presentation material 
and tonight's class is being recorded. So, you know, if you have a friend, family, maybe a coworker that would also like to check out this material, we'll have the full class up on our YouTube channel tomorrow morning. And I'll share with you a little bit more about how to get access to um, the recorded class. All right, well, let's talk about this calculator. And um, what we're gonna do is kind of walk you through, we've pre-filled everything in just to kind of keep us on track from a time perspective, but what this calculator does, and I would encourage you, by the way, to do this kind of exercise at home on your own, but we'll first kind of plug in where I'm at from a current rent perspective. And so in this scenario, I'm at 22.50 in rent. Uh, we have monthly renter's insurance at $15 a month in rent. We're expecting or forecasting that our rent could go up about 5% on an annualized basis as I renew my lease. Um, and then we have the home purchase tab, which I just dropped down here. Um, we have an estimated purchase price of 450000 We have a minimum down payment of 3%. Now, we're going to talk more about loan programs a little bit later in tonight's class, but the minimum down payment for a conventional loan as a first-time buyer is 3%. We estimate property taxes for the house. We have homeowner's insurance. We have the maintenance costs of the house. Um, and so those get kind of all plugged into the home purchase um, section of this calculator. And then from a loan perspective, then we're gonna put some of the, the characteristics of our loan. So we have a 30 year fixed mortgage. Uh, we put an interest rate of 6.25%. That obviously is subject to change. And we'll talk about interest rates in just a few minutes. Uh, we have origination charges. So when we think about origination charges, those are gonna be the costs that you're gonna pay for your financing. Now, one of the, the benefits that we have is in partnering with the Maryland alumni is we actually discount our origination cost by $750 to have an added bonus there for you as well. And then at times, some buyers will elect to pay what we call as discount points. And discount points are where a buyer is paying more funds out of pocket in order to bring down that interest rate. Now, usually one discount point is the equivalent of 1% of my loan amount. So if I finance $400,000 and I pay 1.1% is $4,000. Uh, now, generally, that'll equate to just about a quarter percent reduction in interest rate. Now, in today's market where we're kind of in flux from an interest rate perspective, we're starting to see interest rates hopefully start to lean down a little bit. It doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to, to buy points in today's market because it usually has about a three to four year break even point. So we don't necessarily recommend it for some of our buyers that need to achieve a certain payment level just for affordability or qualifying, then it might make a little bit more sense. But generally, you know, discount points are something we probably won't necessarily want to invest in right now. And then we have other settlement services. We're looking at title, escrow fees, maybe attorney fees, depending on what state you're in. And then finally, the last tab is other assumptions. And those other assumptions include, how long do I think I'm gonna be in the house? Um, how much is it gonna cost me to sell my house seven years from now? What state I am, I'm in and state and federal tax rate that I wanna apply to my scenario? And then finally, a savings rate. And so what this calculator comes back to us, it does two things. One is it's going to show us what's the bud budget going to look like comparing renting versus buying. So we know that our from a rent perspective, we're just over $2,200 a month in rent. And then from the buy side, we're going to have to expect a, a, a kind of an increase, right? Thirty Up to $3,700 a month from a buying perspective. But at the same time, if we look at our total cost opportunity over the next seven years, we still end up on the positive side by buying versus renting. It's about $65,000 of the opportunity. Now, how do we get there? Well, we get there because of the tax benefits potentially of owning a home, but more importantly, home equity over the next seven years of appreciation over that course of time of ownership. So that's truly the kind of the real difference in renting versus buying. Now, all markets look a little bit different, um, you know, depending on what your appreciation rate looks like, depending on what interest rate you purchase at. Um, but I do think over the next couple of years, many existing homeowners that are purchasing in today's market will probably have an opportunity to refinance in the next couple of years. And by doing so, maybe that 6.25 or 6.5 rate now becomes 5.5 or 5.25, and that creates more savings or and better affordability for buyers down the road, and then probably improves that savings number quite a bit too. All right, so that's where I would encourage, as you're thinking about homeownership, 
let's start with the budgeting calculator. I think that's a great way of kind of framing up for you what it could look like of comparing where I'm currently at from a housing perspective versus what could it look like if I decide to purchase a home. Now, that's also something we'll walk you through as part of a home buying consultation that we'll talk a little bit more later on in tonight's class. Let's take a look at the housing market. We're going to take a look at Maryland's housing market for right now. Doesn't look terribly different than the rest of the country. In fact, I just taught a class last night um, for another one of our university partnerships. Um, and in that kind of snapshot they were looking at in the Midwest, like the housing appreciation, you know, had a very similar kind of trajectory here. We had this kind of like kind of downward move a little bit. Um, prices look a little bit different, but, you know, kind of we're seeing a, a different move in the market right now. Part of that is attributed to we've kind of had a late summer buying season for many of, of our home buyers. You know, generally in our industry, right around April, May, we start seeing the spring buying pick up and then it kind of moves into the summer, right? So summer months, generally most families are trying to figure out what city they want to live in or maybe a school district they want to be a part of. Um, so, and of course, nicer weather brings out home buying as well too. But this year has been a little bit different. I think the buyer behavior has changed a little bit. In July, we started to see that, that uptick in buyer activity, namely because most consumers are saying, hey, you know what? I think this is kind of where we're going to be from an interest rate perspective. And if I don't enter the market now, potentially I could miss out because interest rates, when they come down, will generally create more buyer activity. And here's kind of a look at interest rates. Um, so this is kind of a chart over the last 12 months to show you what interest rates have looked like. Now, going all the way back to October of 2023, you see the huge mountain peak there. That was interest rates at 8% or just pretty close to 8%. Now, we've seen rates come down over the last uh, several months. In fact, just two weeks ago, we hit equivalent le levels to April of 2023. Um, and that was just two weeks ago. Now, some of that was due to the fallout of the Japan financial markets. It had some challenges. The market has kind of recovered a little bit. And now currently we sit right around, right now about a 6.5% average 30-year uh, fixed interest rate. Now, the question is, how are we here from an interest rate perspective? Because many of you, have, you know, were, you know, interested in home ownership back during the pandemic when rates are two and three percent. Now we're almost double that. Well, a lot of why we're here from an interest rate perspective is attributed to where we're at and where we have been inflationally what inflation wise as a country. So the Federal Reserve has ratcheted up the federal funds rate to combat inflation. Um, the inflation goals for the Federal Reserve are two percent. Not quite there yet, but there is, you know, some rumblings right now that we may see interest rate cuts as early as next month. In fact, yesterday we saw rates trying to kind of start dipping down a little bit on the heels of some of the meeting minutes from the Federal Reserve, um, giving some type of indication that we might see a rate cut in September. That could, rate cut be, could be as high as half a percent. Now, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio Federal Reserve rate cut to mortgage interest rates. In fact, I just shared a video with uh, some clients just, just a few minutes ago that we'll probably see rates drift a little bit lower as we get towards the Federal Reserve meeting as long as there's kind of an indication that that rate cut is coming. But just because they'll cut rates maybe half a percent perspectively doesn't mean the mortgage rates would drop a half a percent. But we're going to be watching that pretty carefully. You know, I think well, as we move further through 2024, we go into elections, we'll probably see rates start to come down a little bit. I don't think we're going to be in the fives um, range, but we'll probably stay in that low six range. And then as we move into 2025, we'll start to see rates hopefully normalize to more historical levels, which would be probably in the 5.25 to five and a half range. Um, so, you know, many of our buyers that are considering entering home ownership. If we're entering today, it's probably not going to be for the long-term loan. We're probably just use, utilizing financing just to get access to the housing market. But probably in the next couple of years, many of our buyers that have bought in 2023 and 2024, uh, maybe some of in the, in the latter part of 2022, will be looking to refinance their home down the road. Now, all interest rates aren't the same for all buyers. And I think that's important to understand because there's different characteristics that go into interest rate, like credit eligibility, higher my credit score is, potentially the higher my in, or the better my interest rate is going to be, the type of product that I'm going to do, how much I decide to finance, what, what does my down payment look like. We talked a little bit earlier about paying discount points where we can potentially bring down our interest rates by paying more out of pocket. And then finally, the term of my loan can also influence that interest rate. So if I, if I shorten my term of my loan, then potentially that could bring down my interest rate. 
Now, credit's probably one of the biggest drivers of many aspects of home financing. We just talked about it with interest rates. It can also influence your product selection as well as mortgage insurance that you're going to learn a little bit more about in tonight's class. So we always like to kind of dive into credit and give some tips and resources around credit. And I think it's important to understand that when you apply for home financing, the mortgage lender like us is going to be looking at a mortgage credit score. And there's actually three different models. There's a mortgage model. There's a credit card model and then auto financing for the you know appropriate things that you're going to apply for. Now, here's what the mortgage model looks like over here on screen. So 15% is going to be how long have I had credit? So the more mature my credit file is, potentially the higher my credit score could be. 20% is going to be how much new credit am I trying to access? Am I opening new accounts? Um, am I um, inquiring with new creditors? That's going to have a 20% influence on the score. And then 30% is going to be credit utilization. So we're focused there on revolving accounts. So we're looking at our credit limits that are available to us versus what our credit balances are. Now, ideally, we want that percentage to be at 10% or less. Now, if you just big, booked a big trip uh, to Hawaii and now you charge up that credit card and maybe you're 80 or 90% utilization, we would recommend to try to first, as kind of a step one, let's try to get that balance below 50% utilization. Once we're good there, then let's try to get that below 10% utilization. Now, maybe you didn't know this, but each credit card company reports out your information to the agencies on the billing cycle or statement date. And why that's important is because if you can pay off or pay down your balance before the end of the billing or statement date, what you're going to do is you're going to bring down that balance lower, improve your utilization of credit, and potentially lift your credit score. Um, many of our clients are in the habit of maybe paying on the due date, which there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But if you're really trying to capture the, the highest available credit score, we'd encourage you to try to pay those bills before the end of the billing or, state, or statement date. And then finally, payment history, which is the, the largest weighting of the credit score model, that's looking at how we've paid our bills. If we've had any late payments, they're going to be rated as 30-day lates, 60-day lates, and 90-day plus delinquencies. So the more severe on the spectrum of lates, the bigger the impact is going to be in, on my score. Now, we're especially going to be looking at things that have happened in the last 12 to 24 months impacting our score. So if I had a late payment, let's say in October of 2023, I'm still inside that 12 months. So it's probably going to have a pretty big impact on my score. But as I get further away from that late payment, most importantly, beyond maybe two years, then I'll probably see that score start to pick up a little bit. Now, there's three credit agencies that I'm sure you're all familiar with, right? There's Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Each agency has a different way of scoring um, uh, for each model. And so if you pull your score with Experian, it's probably going to look different than Equifax or TransUnion. If you are using a credit monitoring service, that's great. Just keep in mind, they're probably using the credit card model. And that's going to look different from mortgage because as clients reach out to us for consultations, you know, they'll say, hey, I'm a 760 credit score because that's what, you know, Wells Fargo told me on my app, right? Well, it's not necessarily going to look that way on the mortgage score because the risk attributes look a little bit different. Now, every loan program has a minimum credit score, and you can see some of those programs on screen. We're going to talk about loan programs in just a few minutes, but just keep that in mind. So based upon the applicable program, there is going to be a minimum credit score tied to that. Um, now, one of the things that comes up in my conversations with clients is uh, closing out of accounts. And you know, if you decide to close out a credit card, you can certainly do that. I would just be aware that when you close out a credit card, it could impact your length of credit because when you close out a credit card and you say, hey, I'm no longer going to use that account, I want, I don't want access to it anymore, it basically pulls away all the history from the credit bureaus. And it can do two things. One is it can impact your, your length of credit, but now you no longer have that line of credit or trade line available to you on the amount owed or utilization section. So it could also kind of give you a double double hit to your score. So just be careful of that. Um, now, in lending, we look at all three scores, and so each one of those scores are going to look a little bit different, but we do take the middle credit score of all three agencies. So if my top score is 760, my middle score is 740, and let's say my lowest score is 720, we're going to use 740 as a score for qualifying purposes. Now, if my partner wants to join the application, we can certainly do that, but let's say my partner is at 720, 700, 680, 
Well, the 700 score that my partner has is the lowest score between the two of us. So that's the score that would be used from a qualifying perspective as it relates to interest rate, my program opportunity, as well as like mortgage insurance. Now, if you've had more severe items on your credit report, like let's say bankruptcies or significant late payments, this is a matrix that'll kind of guide you as to how long they'll be on your credit report. But in the most recent 12 to 24 months from the date of the event is really kind of where the impact is going to be to your score. But things like late payments, for example, will stay with you for seven years on your credit report, but really kind of the, the, the impact to the scores in the most recent 12 to 24 months. Now, student loans also report to credit agencies, as we know, um, and there's a way that as lenders, we look at those student loans. So I think that's really important for you to understand as a prospective buyer. Um, if you're in an income-based repayment program right now, we're going to use the income-based repayment amount from a qualifying perspective. So let's say I had $75,000 in student loan debt, and I'm on a $250 per month IBR payment. Well, that's the payment that can use, be used from a qualifying perspective. Now, let's say I'm back in school and I'm on deferment because of it, but I still want to purchase a home because I have a source of income and I, you know, it, that's what I want to do. That's one of my goals. That's okay. But at the same time, if it's in deferment, we have to use either 1% of the balance on a conventional loan or half a percent of, um, or sorry, 1% for the balances for a conventional loan, 0.5% for an FHA loan. Um, if you have um, loan forgiveness for a student loan and we have documentation for that, then we certainly don't need to qualify you with that outstanding student loan payment. But if you are in forbearance or deferment, we do have to count a minimum payment for qualifying purposes. All right, let's transition into loan programs. And I want to kind of share with you just a little bit more about kind of what different resources are available to you as buyers. And we're going to take a look at five different programs. Um, two or three of those are going to be most applicable probably to this audience for tonight. But I want to kind of give you a high level look at each one of these products. And then we're going to do a quick uh, product comparison of looking at a conventional loan versus an FHA loan um, centered around mortgage insurance. And the first loan is a conventional loan. That has a minimum down payment of 3% up to a loan amount of 766550 That loan amount level is considered the conforming loan limit. Now, that conforming loan limit changes every year based upon the cost of living, and it's set by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And that kind of tells us as lenders what we can finance up to. Now, certain what we call high cost of living markets in the country, you know, some of our, you know, Eastern um, markets, maybe some of the Midwest markets like Chicago or West Coast, they do have higher loan amounts that we can get to called high balance loan limits. Now, anytime as a lender, we go beyond 766550 in amount financed, that down payment moves from 3% to 5%. And so that's just something we wanna be aware of if we're gonna need a little bit more lending resources. When we think about the conventional loan, it's Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They originate probably 70% or of all mortgages across the country. Um, and they do have a minimum credit score of 620. Um, and so as long as I'm a first time buyer, I can take advantage of that product if I'm eligible and put as little as 3% down for that product. Next product is the FHA loan. Also, it's considered it's the, it's a federally insured loan. So it's a government insured loan. It stands for the Federal Housing Administration Loan under HUD or the Housing and Urban Development. And so that product has a little bit more flexibility than say a conventional loan, uh, namely because it's a government insured loan. As a minimum credit score of 580, minimum down payment of three and a half percent, the minimum or the maximum uh, loan amount is set by county. So based upon the, count, the cost of living for that county, you'll have a maximum loan amount. So we're looking at this loan amount for the general Maryland market at 498,257. The VA loan for our veterans that have served and have VA home loan eligibility is an amazing product. It's a zero down payment option. In fact, you can finance above a million dollars and still have a zero down payment option. Um, the veterans loan is far more flexible from a guidelines perspective to encourage home ownership for our veterans and to best support them. It has a minimum credit score of 620, um, but it is gonna be a lot more flexibility in terms of qualifying. Things like what we call debt to income ratio will be a little bit easier. If a veteran has some past credit challenges, we'll have a little bit more flexibility with the VA home loan. And then to the right is the USDA product. That's for clients that need to purchase in more kind of rural areas, uh, maybe lesser populated areas. There's two big qualifiers with the USDA product. It needs to be in one of those designated rural areas. 
And then also you have to qualify under the household income guidelines. So um, those are the two kind of big qualifiers. But the benefit there is the USDA product has a zero down payment option, which can be really great for our clients. Um, and then finally, there's the jumbo loan product. Those are for clients that need a little bit more resources in terms of amount finance. So if I'm in a market that has a maximum loan amount of 766550, but I'm purchasing maybe a million dollar house, right? I could lean into the jumbo loan product, which is going to have a higher um, resource or loan amount that's available to you. Now, it does also require higher down payments, which can be anywhere between 10 to 20 percent down certainly higher credit score requirements. There's also higher asset requirements, which requires a buyer to save up not only just their down payment and closing costs, but we call as reserves for their home purchase, which reserves basically are assets that I have left behind after I've contributed the down payment and closing costs. In a jumbo loan product, usually it's going to be about 12 months of my equivalent monthly payment. So if my payments say $8,000 a month, I probably need about $96,000 in additional assets. All right, let's talk a little bit about PMI. I mean, and many of you have probably done some calculations on Zillow or Redfin and, you know, run these PMI calculations and you're just kind of under trying to understand what it is. Well, there's two different forms of, of mortgage insurance. There's private mortgage insurance, which would be part of a conventional loan. And there's FHA mortgage insurance, which would be for a government insured loan. So let's kind of talk a little bit about each one of those. So, if we look at the conventional PMI options, there's various ways that you can pay PMI. You can do it monthly. You can pay for it in what we call split MI, where some of it's monthly, some of it's upfront. You can do what we call a single premium, where you buy out the MI it's in, in its entirety, basically by increasing your out-of-pocket expense. And there's also lender paid MI, and that's where you elect to take a higher interest rate in order to buy out the mortgage insurance. Now, most clients will elect the monthly mortgage insurance because Mortgage insurance generally has a cancellation option that once I reach two years in my loan and achieve 20 to 22% equity, I can apply to have the mortgage insurance canceled. Now, if you've done some home searching on Redfin or Zillow or any other site that you've looked at, maybe you've used, used some of their payment calculators, nothing wrong with that. But I would encourage you that those uh, mortgage insurance calculators that, or the mortgage insurance component of the calculator is not really super accurate because of the different attributes that are part of mortgage insurance, like credit score, down payment, and amount finance. Those factors will make up your premium. In fact, it looks very similar to auto insurance, right? So the more expensive my car is, the more driving I do, um, you know, the more expensive auto insurance will be. Similar to mortgage insurance, higher my credit score is, higher my down payment, less my, my cost is going to be for mortgage insurance. So if we looked at a scenario like we have on screen of someone that financed 450,000, let's say they were putting 3% down as their minimum down payment and they had a 740 credit score, they're probably paying about $183 a month in mortgage insurance. Certainly a lot less than you'll see online when you're doing some calculators. So just something to kind of consider. Now, as we walk clients through their different home buying um, options, we're gonna kind of walk through and say, okay, this is what the payment looks like, including mortgage insurance, but that hopefully gives you a better idea what the mortgage insurance amount might look like. Now on the FHA side of things, the government insured mortgage insurance looks a little bit different. There's actually two forms of mortgage insurance. There's upfront mortgage insurance, which is 1.75% of the total loan amount. There's also monthly mortgage insurance, which is 0.55% of the loan amount. Now that 1.75% gets added into my total amount finance. So it will increase my total balance. And with FHA mortgage insurance, there is not a cancellation option. So the only way I can exit mortgage insurance with an FHA loan is to basically refinance out of that loan. Now, here's an example on the FHA mortgage insurance product. Take the same $450,000 loan amount. We add on the upfront mortgage insurance, that one-time fee of 1.75%. And then we have the monthly amount of 0.55. So that puts that at about 206 for the monthly, 7,800 for the upfront. And then we do kind of a comparison from the FHA to the conventional loan. You know, certainly the FHA loan is going to be a little bit more expensive um, because of the upfront and the monthly so, you know, many clients may say, well, I really want to get into a conventional loan. And you probably do, um, but not all clients are going to qualify for a conventional loan. I think that's important to understand, um, you know, because of maybe some more flexibility in an FHA loan versus a conventional loan, that might be a better product for our clients. Maybe it's credit score driven, maybe it's income verification. There's a whole variety of different reasons, but 
we're going to figure out the right solution for you based upon your kind of goals and objectives for home ownership. Last thing I want to leave you with here on this screen is that if you've already started looking at loan programs and maybe you're even doing interest rate searches online, generally the FHA loan is going to come up as a lower interest rate option. But what you what what's important to understand is that the FHA loan comes with a lot more expenses, as you've kind of heard today, with around mortgage insurance on a monthly basis and the upfront. So, you know, if an FHA rate is 5.75, maybe the conventional rate is at 6.25 but we have to factor in those differences from an expense perspective. All right. Now, before I kind of switch gears and talk a little bit about income qualifying, do we have any questions from the audience that I can help answer? You guys hanging in there with us? <laughs> All right. Let's talk a little bit about income. And, you know, as we build plans for clients, you know, we're going to go through income verification, um, and of course, there's different scenarios that comes along with income as well, too. Now, there's a bit of a misconception around income uh, timelines. Um, so some clients come to us and believe that they have to have two years on their job, which is just not the case. In fact, the way the two-year income verification rule works is that I have to show that I've had education that supports my job right now or been on the job for two years. So you know, the example I use for most of our classes is that let's say I graduated from the University of Maryland in the fall and I started my job on January 1. Well, if I spent four years at Maryland and now I've started my job, I've fulfilled the two-year requirement that's needed for home financing. So, you know, a lot of people are kind of, you know, that are have maybe got that answer from a different lender, um, may have been discouraged for home ownership, but it, the rule is really around showing a total of two years education and or, you know, job history. Now, um, you know, the, the, where the two-year rule may be a little bit more challenging for some clients is that if you have dual employment, so let's say I'm in the healthcare industry and I work for one clinic for 40 hours a week, another clinic for 30 hours a week. Now, in that case, I do have to show that I've been working in both jobs simultaneously for the last two years. Also for self-employed clients, if I may be on a 1099 basis or I have my own business, I do have to show that I filed taxes for two years in order to use that income from a qualifying perspective. Now, at times we'll have clients that, you know, have additional sources of income, maybe from a partner or from room and board that they have in their current rental place. Generally, those other sources of income cannot be used uh, for qualifying purposes. Now, if my partner is contributing to the household, the only way my partner's income can be added into the equation is if they're part of the application. Now, if the last thing I would leave you with from an income standpoint is that if I'm working, say, a 40-hour workweek job, and I also maybe drive for Uber or Lyft on the side, if I want to include the Uber and Lyft income, first of all, it's probably 1099 income, so you're getting paid, and and, and then you're filing what we call a Schedule C on your federal taxes. But if I want to factor in that income, I do have to show that I've been doing both my 40-hour workweek job and my self-employment job for the last two years. Now, within income, as a lender, we're going to evaluate expenses versus that versus your income. And we actually look at gross monthly income for W-2 wage earners. The expenses that we're looking at is the new house payment, bills like personal loans, credit cards, car payments. We generally don't want those expenses to exceed more than 43 to 45% of our gross monthly income. Now, this is just a calculation that we use. It's a, it's a metric for qualifying, not necessarily an affordability metric because really affordability is going to come through understanding a little bit more about your budget and kind of helping guide, guide you with a plan that makes sense for you based upon what's outgoing from your household expenses and what's coming in from an income perspective. But debt to income ratio gives lenders kind of a guideline for qualifying. So here's kind of what that calculation looks like. It's con considering the principal and interest of my loan the property taxes and the insurance for that property that I'm considering. And then if I'm putting less than 20% down or I'm using an FHA loan, PMI or mortgage insurance, and if I'm deciding to purchase maybe a condo or a townhouse, then we want to factor in HOA expenses. And then we also look at the other debts, like I mentioned. So we'll add those to the expenses. So in this scenario, let's say we had $3,000 in expenses. And if I'm making $8,500 a month, my debt to income ratio is 35.2%. Now, the question I get from buyers is, well, what's a good number to have? And it varies for every client, but I would say the comfort zone for most buyers is going to be somewhere between 33 to 36%. 
All right, we got a question in 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 the group, so I want to answer that really quick. Which is, what happens if you have gaps um, in employment? I think is what they're referring to. What if you have gaps in employment in in the last two years? So you can have gaps in employment. Just depends on how wide the gap is. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of gaps in employment, certainly during the pandemic, where there's a lot of job loss at that time. But um, as long as we can explain the 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 gap of employment, then it should be easy to overcome from a financing perspective. But I think the follow-up to that would just be, it just depends on how long that, that gap was. All right, thanks for the question. Now, the last component to kind of building a home buying plan is taking a look at assets and what we have saved up for our home purchase. Now, I'm going to talk through talk you through a savings plan exercise in just a bit, but I want to kind of share with you the documentation that we'll generally need from a home buying perspective. We usually need to have the last 60 days of asset statements. If you do want to elect to use a retirement account, you could potentially do that. I would just encourage you to talk to your tax or financial advisor before you access those assets, 401ks, 403bs, IRAs. Now, gift funds can also be allowed, and that's where a family member is helping contribute towards your home purchase. Um, there is no seasoning requirement for gift funds. Uh, generally, other assets have to be at least seasoned 60 days. Now, in building home buying plans for our clients, like I said earlier, there's usually two challenges to home ownership. It could be around credit because we just maybe we're a little overextended or we've had some past challenges. Also, it could be around savings. And so what I want to share with our class is just a quick little savings plan to help you get on that path towards homeownership. We'll also take a look at some first-time buyer programs, but if you're thinking about home buying, I think starting with savings is a big part of that. And so here's a kind of a really quick discipline I'd share with you. And we'll, we'll, when we meet with clients, you know, usually the monthly payment is not the challenge. It's just saving up the down payment and closing costs. So let's say I, I currently pay $2,000 a month in rent. But after I we meet with this client, you know we can afford to pay about three thousand dollars a month in in total um, housing expense. So that means I'm going to go from renting at two thousand dollars a month to owning at three thousand. Now, if I'm not quite ready there from a savings perspective, what I would encourage our clients to do is start paying like you're actually or start saving like you're paying a mortgage payment today. So at the first of the month, when I'm getting ready to write that check for my for my landlord of two thousand dollars a month make it $3,000, but take that extra $1,000 and just create the discipline of moving that to your savings account every month. And it does two things. One is it's obviously, obviously going to accrue savings over time. At the end of six months, I have $6,000. End of the year, I have $12,000. But it also creates the discipline and really the kind of the habit of paying a $3,000 mortgage payment. So eventually when I do get a chance to purchase a home, it's not such a big leap for me to go from $2,000 to $3,000 a month. And we're not even factoring high yield savings accounts that can earn you three to 4% interest. And I just think that's a great way of kind of starting yourself down that path to towards home ownership if savings is a challenge for you. Now, there are other resources out there for you as first time buyers. Each state across the country usually has a housing finance agency. And right in Maryland, we also have a, a, a housing agency that is supporting low to moderate income households and home ownership. So the Department of Housing and Community Development for the state of Maryland has a variety of different programs. Here's kind of a snapshot of what some of those look like. There's the MMP First Time Advantage Program. You can see some of the benefits there of a $6,000 no interest loan that can go towards your down payment or closing costs. You can take advantage of a 3% of your sales price loan that can go also towards the down payment uh, and closing costs or a 5% loan. These will all adjust. The reason why there are different levels, they do adjust the first mortgage interest rate. And then there's also the MMP flex loans um, that are going to give you a little more flexibility in terms of lower interest rates. There's also assistance of up to $5,000 um, or 3% of your loan amount. So those are a variety of different solutions that we can help kind of fill the void when it comes to resources needed for down payment and closing costs. And those are things we can certainly talk through as part of a consultation with our clients. Well, speaking of consultations, every client we get a chance to work with does one-on-one -on -one consultations with us. And many of our clients that come to us come through us through our workshops. And after our workshops, um, we'll get connected with you for a one-on-one -on -one session. You're going to learn a little bit more about what that looks like in just a little bit. But as we meet with you for these 30-minute sessions, we're going to build goals and objectives towards homeownership. And then the output of that session can be what we call is to be pre-approved. 
and pre-approved kind of starts you on that path towards home ownership. So I want to kind of talk through the six steps of home buying um, to kind of let you know what you would experience as a home buyer. And now before I do that, let me just answer a quick follow-up question I had um, from the audience. And then we're going to, we're going to go through each one of these milestones. Um, and that question was, can the loan programs be combined? Um, depending on the program, yes. Um, so if we were referring to some of the first time buyer programs, some of them can be combined. Um, if you're looking to combine, like say a, a local city program with maybe a state program, it just depends. Depends off there's any like uh, deed restrictions for those particular loans, but we can certainly talk through that as part of a meeting with us. All right, thanks for the question. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the six steps of home buying. So this kind of shows you where we go from a consultation. So the output of meeting for a consultation would be to pre-approve, be a pre-approved. Pre and a pre-approval is showing you as a buyer what you're eligible for, what my sales price looks like, down payment, amount finance, the prospective interest rate for that day in the market that you got a chance to meet with us. That comes in the form of a certificate that you can now present to a seller. So if you find a home that you love, you can use that pre-approval to show a seller that your financing has been validated. Now, that pre-approval can be easily recertified. So even though it does have a 60-day timestamp on it, you can take your time buying. You know, we have many of our clients who are looking several months down the road, maybe even a couple of years down the road. Um, so we want to encourage you to know that you can get that pre-approval recertified at any time. Now, step two is going to be the house hunting phase. Now, most often it really starts online, right? Maybe some of you have already done it before tonight's class. Um, once you've kind of narrowed down your search, then you'll probably start going out and physically looking at homes. We'd encourage you to connect with a local realtor in your market um, that can help be a support for you, um, whether it's presenting offers, you know, finding the right school district that matches up for you, negotiating the contract, organizing like inspections, all those important things that realtors do. Now, you may have heard about some of the recent uh, commission changes that were announced with the lawsuit of, uh, against the National Association of Realtors. Uh, I would encourage you, once you talk to a realtor, maybe ask them a few questions about that because that does change the way in which realtors are compensated. Um, and so, you know, those are things that have just changed as of the last week um, where it's not a kind of a given that sellers pay for realtor commissions that has to be negotiating as part of their buyer realtor agreement. So um, those are conversations you can certainly have with a realtor. Now, as we continue on in the process, you know, we're doing the house hunting and now let's say we find a house that we love and we submit an offer, that offer gets accepted. Now we're going to move to step three and that's called entering escrow. So that means a seller has accepted our offer and now we're starting what we call the escrow process. Usually from the time of acceptance to the time I get my keys, that process is going to take about 30 days. Now, what I think it's interesting to, to know is that your mortgage payment does not necessarily start, or your first mortgage payment does not necessarily start right away once you close escrow on your home. In fact, some of our clients that are purchasing their homes and closing in the month of August are actually not starting their payment until October 1st. And the reason why that is, is because mortgage interest is always paid a month behind schedule. Um, and so a lot of clients that are kind of trying to timeline out like, when my lease expires and when I should start looking for homes and when I should close escrow, that hopefully kind of gives you a better idea of what that looks like. So if I'm closing escrow in August, my first payment would start October 1st. Now, what happens at step three once my offer is accepted? Well, we're gonna you're gonna get a call from us saying congratulations, let you know, hey, we we're in receipt of your accepted contract. We'll talk a little bit about timelines, uh, action items on your side, and then we're also gonna schedule you for what we call as a follow up consultation. That's where we get a chance to go through all the numbers of your financing, what the interest rates look like, monthly payments, out of pocket expense, so you have a clear picture of what your financing scenario entails. Also, that will start the process, which includes ordering an appraisal on the house, getting your inspections ordered through your realtor. And as a buyer in most states, you're going to be responsible for making what we call as an earnest money deposit. And that's a good faith deposit for the transaction. Those funds will count towards your total out of pocket. And the earnest money deposit is usually one to 2% of the total sales price. Now, inside of your contract, there are what we call as contingency periods in most states. And those contingencies at, allow you as a buyer to kind of do your homework on the property, which would include getting the house appraised to make sure the home is worth what you're buying it for, 
getting the house inspected, which your realtor will help organize inspections like roof inspections, foundational inspections, sewer inspections. Then of course, getting your loan approved. And these um, contingencies will generally happen in the first 14 to 21 days of your contract, depending on what's specified and agreed upon with the seller. Now, as we continue down the path, the step four is the processing and the underwriting of the loan. That's more of kind of the administrative task of the loan. By that time, we probably locked in your interest rate uh, in the market. And that is, there's some strategy to locking in the interest rate at the right time. That's one of the things that will help kind of guide you through. Because as you heard earlier during our interest rate sections, there's a lot of going on economically right now. So it's really important to kind of have the right opportunity when it presents itself to be able to lock in your interest rates. Because interest rates change every minute throughout the financial trading day. Step five is going to be the loan approval phase of the process. So that's when an underwriter has reviewed your income, your assets, your credit, and make sure the program matches up for what you need and approves your loan. That loan approval is issued, and it also takes us probably about two to three weeks into the process. We're about three quarters of the way through. It also will probably bring you to the end of your contingency timelines. So if your inspection checks out, your appraisal looks good, and you have your loan approval, then you can officially sign off on your contingency. That sign off tells the seller that you're good with all of your investigative timeline and you're ready to move to the next stage in the process. As a lender, we're also gonna issue to you a three-day cooling off disclosure called a closing disclosure and allows you as a consumer to kind of take a step back and say, okay, this matches up to what I expected in my financing. Um, and there, there won't be any surprises for us. We go through different iterations, iterations of disclosures, you know, during our follow-up session with you, we, we get a full breakdown of everything. So there's no surprises at that point, but that final disclosure kind of validates everything that you've seen in prior disclosures. And then finally at step six, you're going to be signing documents in person with a public notary. Now that's really the only time you need to be in person for this process. Everything else can be done electronically. At that point, you're going to be signing documents in person with either a public notary or an attorney. Um, you'll also be expected to wire in your final amount of funds for the purchase at that time. And then the money from the, the first mortgage and maybe assistance programs that we're providing gets wired in as well after we've completed an audit of your signed loan documents. And then either an escrow team or an attorney team will then reconcile all the numbers in the transaction and then record documents with the local county recorder's office. They usually record a grant deed that transfers ownership to you, as well as a deed of trust that is the agreement to repay the loan. And then after that's all done, guess what? You become the official owner of the home. Usually at least one, two, maybe even three times a day, I get a chance to call new homeowners that we've just helped them with their financing to say, congratulations, you're now a homeowner. And many of those clients are coming from classes just like this that you're sitting in right now. So it usually starts with just kind of learning more about what homeownership is all about helping you guide, basically design a plan, walking through that 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 six steps of home buying, and then hopefully getting to the finish line to be able to purchase your home. So it's a huge celebration uh, that day. And it's going to be one of the biggest um, you know, financial investments you decide to make whenever that time comes. And if you're thinking about moving forward in the process, we'd love to be able to help you on that path towards homeownership. It's a really simple process which requires just a, a really easy online application. We only do a soft credit check and then you would upload proof of your income and assets. And this is a free service we provide. So, you know, whether you're planning on buying this year or next year, or maybe even three or four years out, this is a tool uh, and a resource session that you can use to help design your own financial plan. Um, now, if you have some questions as follow-up from tonight's class, we'd encourage you, you know, use our scheduling system that you saw on the previous slide. You can schedule an introductory call with us. We'll also kind of answer any questions for you. I know we've had a few questions in tonight's class, but maybe you have some specific credit questions or savings questions, or maybe general product questions. We can help answer those during that introductory call. And this is kind of what a consultation looks like. We're going to talk about, you know, where do we want to purchase? What's the interest rate environment look like? What's my budget need to be for home ownership? Do I need to pull from any first-time buyer resources? Is there credit plans that I can put in place? All designed to help me on that path towards home ownership. And again, all the consultations are free services we provide to our local communities that we serve. And those are one-on-one -on -one sessions that you would be doing with me. Um, we also have some great resources like our mobile tools available on Android and Apple. You can start the application process there. You can receive push notifications on what's happening with your application and also just do calculations in, in your home search. So if you're out and about with your realtor and you 
see that house for $250,000 and you really want to wonder what that payment might look like, you can hop on our mobile tool and get a good idea of what that monthly payment looks like. Principal and interest, taxes, insurance, as well as mortgage insurance. So as we kind of get to the end of tonight's class, um, I want to kind of just let you know a little bit more about us and, you know, kind of we'll finish off some questions. But, you know, as part of our class, we are going to have this recorded and up on our YouTube channel tomorrow morning for you. We'll also be sharing back all the presentation materials. We also have some other partnerships all across the country to help serve in home ownership. You know, so if you do have friends, family, maybe some coworkers that think might enjoy uh, classes like this or be able to pull away from some of these resources, we'd encourage you to come check out some of our other classes we have available. Now, in our partnership with the University of Maryland, we have your own designed uh, uh, website that lists our upcoming classes that we have, the ways you can get started in the process, as well as your discount for your offering. You can go to terpsmortgage.com. You can see a full list of all those, those resources available to you. And here's all my contact information. So as a follow-up to tonight's class, if you want to get connected with me, Feel free to shoot me a text, call, email, whatever's good for you. Um, and, you know, we try to support our communities and home ownership of, by providing great resources. So we'd encourage you to follow us on some of our social channels. You know, our, our YouTube channel will have all of our videos housed there at J Made a Mortgage. That's also our handle for our Instagram um, that you can kind of check out uh, and follow some of the stuff that we're putting out there to help best support our communities in home ownership. So with that said, we're at the end of tonight's class. I know we're almost to the top of the hour, but I want to kind of carve out some time for questions. Um, and I appreciate the, uh, the the thanks in the in the chat that I just got from one of our guests. So thank you for that. Um, is there any questions I can help answer for the uh, answer for the audience before we uh, wrap up to tonight's class? Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, if we don't have any questions left tonight's class, we I just want to remind everyone, we will be on campus for homecoming in October. So uh, I know more details are coming out for homecoming, but I believe it's October 19th, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, the Terps are playing against USC, which happens to be one of our other partners. So we're definitely rooting for the Terps that day for sure. Um, and we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you. We'll have a booth out there and have some really cool giveaways. So hopefully you can get a chance to, to check us out at our booth at homecoming. Have a great night. Thank you again for attending our workshop. We look forward to connecting with you soon. Good night.